I don't know how many years I've known him, but it's measured in decades at least. Um, and I don't know how to describe him. To, to me, Paul is a professor at uh, TUD, Technical University of Delft, which to my mind is actually the best design school in the world. Um, seriously. His words. <laughs> um, and uh, I thought of him as someone who did research on emotion and was one of the founders of the Design and Emotion Conference. But uh, today he calls himself Professor of Aesthetics and uh, has worked a lot in product design and product development and put uh, a nice textbook on that and the second book that is about to come out or just came out. Um, but what he's going to do today is tell you about the work he's doing, so therefore I don't have to. <laughs> but I'm delighted that you're visiting us for, for two weeks, by the way. Possibly extend it, I'm told. Maybe. Maybe. We'll see. Thank you so much, Don. Uh, so, hi. Thank you, Michelle. Thank you, Don, uh, for having me, for uh, allowing me to have a, what I tend to call in the Netherlands a mini sabbatical, which is really mini, two weeks or three weeks maybe. Uh, we'll see. Um, I wanted to come here for three months, but that didn't work out completely. Maybe next time. Um, then Michelle gave me the opportunity to give a little talk to the, to the group, to the staff, to the faculty, uh, to introduce myself. And I thought over the last week, what, what am I going to say to these people? It's, there are so many things to say, and then again, um, where to start. So I thought, let's start where I left last week. And, that's, and by doing this, I think I give a nice impression of the kind of life I'm leading at the moment which is uh, a traveling life, more or less. This is um, the National Institute of Design in Ahmedabad, India. I was there last week. So I'm sort of mixed up. Who's from India? No one. I, just, I was there last week. I, I missed it. At NID? Yes. Ah, really? Yeah, okay, <laughs> cool. And you missed it. I will more or less give the same presentation. Good. That's beautiful. So <laughs> this is a lovely campus that they have built there in the, in the heart of India almost. And it was built by these people, Charles and Ray Eames. And Charles and Ray Eames, as you probably all know, uh, I suppose and I hope you all know, are founding fathers of design also, and especially in the US. Um, and they built a beautiful campus and they built a beautiful curriculum. And we had a long uh, discussion with the current um, dean of the school and he explained that the philosophy of Charles and Ray Eames as they wrote it down 50 years ago in the 50s is still very valid and still very much appreciated by the school to this date and that's quite amazing I think. Um, I go to India a lot because I well I was asked by another Indian school a couple of years ago to help them build a new curriculum for a design school. So I feel this, this, um, this legacy of Charles and Ray Eames, I, well, I want to bring that forward to another school and uh, this is pretty nice. So um, the kind of things I will be talking about are related to also to my philosophy of design, what is design about and what I think a good design school should be. Um, Oh yeah, this is the Dean of the School of Design. Uh, his name is Vias, and his first name I cannot pronounce, something. Uh, and this was the conference that we um, participated in. And it was quite interesting. They call it design-driven <coughs> entrepreneurship. So how can we turn our designers that we train at our school into becoming entrepreneurs with their own product, the thing they design themselves? And we had a couple of designers on the stage that explained how they did it. And those were actually amazing products that they showed. And the next day, so we spent that two days, and the next day we talked about the Indian design situation. And if you have been in India and have been um, dealing with the situation of design in India, you probably know that there's a lack of designers on the one hand. They need many more designers than they currently have. And secondly, and most importantly, they are shifting their awareness, and we were just discussing it over lunch, they're shifting their awareness of design being mostly 
uh, a matter of styling to make products look more pretty, as is the traditional view of design also in India, into design as, uh, let's say, a principle of change in society in any domain. And that's the transition they are going through at the moment, and that makes it very challenging and interesting to be in India at, at the time. And what you see here is that NID, which is already a renowned design school in, in the heart of India for 50 years, is now expanding all over India to build new design schools. Um, so I gave a talk there, and that's pretty much the same talk as I will give now, which more or less summarizes what I've been working on over the past 25 years, since I know Don. Um, and yeah, to start off, I make another side trip because when I entered in India, I came from Hong Kong. This is not Hong Kong, this is Edward Hopper. Um, but I took a similar picture from my hotel room and I love to show pictures as people at, and I'm not a good photographer, but this Hopper picture I really like. And I was there to give a, a workshop, a two day workshop at the, um, and that's very interesting to mention, I think, when it concerns the design situation worldwide. And I think all of us, we, of course, we live in our area, we do our work, you do your work in San Diego, I do my work in Delft, but we're all global citizens. As much as some people want, do not want to believe that, we are global citizens. And when it comes to design, the world is our playing field, right? So um, I was in Hong Kong for two days, last week, before the last week, uh, where I gave a, a two-day workshop to an executive MBA, EMBA, of the Chinese University of Hong Kong, CUHK, on experience design. So these people are executives from all kinds of industries, service industries, manufacturing industries, and most of them are product managers, marketeers, CEOs, whatever of small and medium and bigger firms who want to understand design, who want to understand what design can bring to their organization. And that's what I try to explain. And I think it's very interesting that although these people start to acknowledge that design could be an important asset to their, to their work, to their, um, could have some value to what they are doing, they have no idea yet what it is. And they really want to find out what design thinking actually entails and how they can um, communicate better with designers or even become designers a little bit themselves. And as we agreed over lunch today, and uh, there are many links to the lunch meeting we had today, as we agreed today, um, everybody can be a designer, but not everybody is a good designer. And these people thought they could design, but after two days I had to, I had to make them uh, realize that they are not good designers yet. But that may take some time. Okay, so um, the workshop was a, more or less about experience design because experience design or design for experience is more or less my uh, core field of study. And so let me start with the bike. This is not a bike that I use today to commute to the school. This is a uh, Van Moeve bike. This was designed by one of our students many years ago and he started his own company. So this is a nice introduction of an entrepreneurial designer who is uh, a fan of bikes, wanted to design a commuter bike, and that is very special. It's very lightweight, it's an aluminum body. It has the lights integrated in the frame, that sort of thing. And it's the ultimate commuter bike, and this is the way they um, present it at the website. This bike not only allows you to bike smoothly, it makes you go to work whistling. Isn't that marvelous? You go to work whistling through this bike, not because you like your work so much, but because this bike makes you go to work whistling. Well, that's a beautiful experiential promise that the bike gives. And what I've been basically trying to teach the students at the MBA, EMBA workshop, and what I've been working on um, for the last 15 years probably, is how can an artifact create a particular experience 
or when you reason the other way around, when you aim for a particular experience. And it all started off 15 years ago when KPN, which is the Dutch telecom provider, asked us, can you help us design a mobile phone that will create a wow experience? And then we said, wait a minute, a wow experience? What is a wow experience? And then we started to analyze the wow experience. And that's where it all started. It all started with understanding the transition from the how, how do we experience everyday artifacts, into the what. What kind of properties does the product, the system, the artifacts, the service need to have in order to instigate or make this experience that you are aiming for uh, very likely to happen. And most of that work is put together already 10 years ago in this book. I didn't see it on the shelves here. It's a little. Why did you come bearing gifts? Uh, it's, it's, it's extremely heavy. <laughs> no, no, it's, it's awfully heavy. It's an Elsevier book, so then you know. Okay, so uh, this book was brought out in 2007. And one of the interesting um, distinctions that we advocated in the book was this distinction between different levels of an experience or different components of an experience. So instead of talking about experiences in terms of like or dislike, as Facebook wants us to believe, we can talk about experiences in a much more fine-grained uh, way and we can develop a vocabulary to talk in a very um, specific way about the kinds of experiences we are aiming for and we could be aiming for as a, as a designer or as an industry. And we made a distinction between a couple of levels of the experience. And of course, you see the emotional experience here below and Donald wrote a lovely book about that one. The experience of meaning is of course the the, the whole notion of meaning attribution. People attribute all kinds of characteristics, personality characteristics often, to artifacts, to services, in order to describe what they mean to them. So this is a field of study that um, has its legitimate, legitimate place. And first of all, the aesthetic experience. And the aesthetic experience, we feel and we have explained extensively in many publications, is conceptually and psychologically different from the other two. These three are different in the sense, are different layers of an experience in the sense that they um, go back to different psychological processes that are underlying them. Well, not everybody agrees here, but this is the, this is the view that we have been uh, defending all the time. And I want to take you a little bit on the tour with me on the aesthetic experience because this is an experience that I've been, studied mo I've been studying most extensively over the years and especially over the last five years. About five years ago I was in a fortunate, well I had the luck, well which is not really luck but that's the way you should put it. Uh, I received a big grant because I wrote a proposal and it was granted which is the biggest personal grant you can get in the Netherlands, which is one and a half million euros, that's serious money, to study aesthetics for five years. And I just finished it a few weeks ago. So this is the model that I've been developing um, to explain our aesthetic likings. So some people said already in the past, uh, Paul is the um, professor of beauty and ugliness, and I think by now I can call myself the expert in aesthetics. And if you want to know anything about aesthetics, please ask me in the coming weeks. So um, this is a field that is very dear to me, especially, and that says a lot about me, I think, I believe. When people talk about aesthetics, there's often this, this conception that there's no accounting for taste, right? You cannot discuss matters of taste, it's all subjective. And when people say something, you cannot discuss it, or it's too subjective to study, then I really get an urge to start and study it. So that's what happened with aesthetics already more than 20 years ago. I really want to understand, because I very much believe if an aesthetic response, a response of liking or beauty, is part of our repertoire, 
there must be an underlying mechanism or logic that explains why we experience something aesthetically the way we do. Do you agree with that? There must be an under underlying logic. Why on earth would we have this sense of beauty if there's no logic explaining where it comes from? I ask you. Well, that's the question I started off with. And that brought me, well, uh, that's the cheapest metaphor of all times, that brought me on a long journey <laughs> towards understanding that the core of an aesthetic episode, I think, I believe, is in the paradox. It's in solving apparent conflicts. This is a beautiful example that I recently got from a friend of mine who's in marketing and branding, actually. He said, one of my favorite brands is Leon. Do you know Leon? It's a UK brand. And they sell naturally fast food. Natural fast food. Isn't that beautiful? Fast food? Fast food is not very healthy, right? It's, it's, it's produced fast and it's eaten fast. It's not good for you. Versus natural, organic. Hey, organic fast food. That's amazing, right? That's what they did. And they are very successful now in the UK. And so the beauty in that brand, the beauty in Lee of Leon, is that they combine two things that we, we up to then consider um, impossible to unite. And this impossibility of, um, of or this, this uh, bringing together of two conflicting positions, that's actually what many of the old laws of aesthetics uh, have in common. So one of them being unity and variety. This is one of my son's early artworks. It's actually the funeral of a hypo, hippo here. <laughs> um, unity and variety is an old principle that was already coined by Aristotle many, many years ago. And it basically says we like things that are on the one hand varied, that show a lot of variation, but at the same time, are as unified as possible, have, have all kinds of unifying principles in that. And if you think of the Crystal principles, they're all about unification of information, okay? Another one that I've been studying extensively, and I have a couple of publications about the Maya principle. And I studied Maya as a principle, and then found out that this principle was actually coined by another legend of American design, Raymond Lowy. You probably all know him as well, also from the 50s, mostly. And this, what Raymond Lowy says, well, um, people like things that are on the one hand as advanced as possible, but at the same time acceptable. He didn't specify what he means by acceptable and advanced, so we operationalized it in terms of typicality and novelty. Advanced, something is advanced when it is novel, we have not seen it before, it's new to the eye, right? But at the same time, it's, 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 it's as typical or familiar as it can be. And this law, or principle as you may call it, uh, turned out to be very robust. We, we have shown it uh, to uh, explain people's preferences for cars, for uh, water kettles, for all kinds of products. And it was, uh, this study was replicated many times by other people after us. So basically it says that a designer can maximize a product's, within a category, a product's uh, novelty while preserving its typicality to some point. So when a designer is able to maximize typicality and novelty at the same time, which is possible because this uh, relationship is not perfectly linear but curvilinear, and that's what you typically see, products that are in this range that maximize the two simultaneously are the ones that are aesthetically most preferred. The interesting consequence, coming back to there is no accounting for taste, such a law as this, or the other one, this one, or the one that I will show next, <coughs> do not, these, although these laws are um, very robust and very, um, they are universal mechanisms, they do not necessarily lead to universal agreement between people. Because what I consider typical or novel may be very atypical to someone in India or in Hong Kong or wherever you go, right? 
So what you consider typical. So at an individual level, this is a law, but this does not ne necessarily lead to universal agreement. I hope you get that point. And so therefore, there's a lot of subjective differences in at the surface level, but underlying it is a law that is very um, <laughs> solid. Another one that I've been studying, and one of my PhDs has been work has just finished a PhD on this, is the law of maximum effect for minimum means. And I think this is a very, another very powerful law for designers to um, defend what they're doing, to explain what they're doing, and to feel that what they are doing is the right thing. So um, designers can also be very um, insecure. But this law can help them to make the right decision at the right time. Because this law basically says, whenever you arrive at a minimal way to solve the problem that you set out for yourself, you probably have come to a very good solution. So if your, if your means are um, too complicated for the problem you set yourself, or your problem, the effect you aim for, is maybe not big enough for the means that you have applied, then you may need to reconsider your design. Uh, I hope you get this example. This, exa this is an example of a little water face that is beautiful in its shape, maybe. We can argue that, but it's symmetrical and it has a couple of qualities that make it um, uh, beautiful. But it's also beautiful in terms of this MEM principle in that it's not only, um, it's, it communicates that it needs to be watered by using the law of gravity. So it slowly tilts and falls over when there's not enough water in, uh, in the vase. So this is a very simple way of solving um, this effect. So that brings me back to this model and I want to talk a little bit about this model as well because when I do design research and when I study principles of design, whether it's principles of aesthetics or emotion or whatever, I always have in mind a particular designer working in a particular way. And I think it is very important for design researchers in general that you have a view of designers or, and or the design process while doing your research. As, as a design researcher, you do research in order to support the design professional, I think, I hope, and I, I think that's very a reasonable assumption. So, as when, when I started to set out doing research on, let's say, how products impact human experience, that was my early research, the one I just showed you, I also started to think about the design process that almost worked in parallel, or I did that simultaneously. And that resulted in a particular design method that is more or less simplified and illustrated here, where we say you can look at products at the product level, at an interaction level, or the experience level, and at a context level. And as a designer, you should always try and regress to this context level, the level where you start off thinking about the world as it unfolds, the world as it appears to you, with all its qualities with all its technological, cultural, psychological, sociological elements or aspects to it that you need to understand. And those, those, all those elements, what we call factors, they help you to build your purpose, to build the reason of existence underlying your design, or what we tend to call, because we love French as well, the raison d'être. And if there are any Germans in the room, there are Germans in the room. The Daseinsgrund, I really like that one as well. So the, the reason of existence underlying the design is the thing you first need to design before you can set out and start to design the outcome, the manifestation or the means. And as you can see, this, this whole MEM principle, minimal, uh, maximum effect for minimal means, is exactly about this relationship. How can we maximize our purpose as a designer and minimize the means by which we attain that purpose? That's basically what a designer 
tries to achieve, right? That's all summarized in this book. There's also an English version of the book. There was first an English version of the book, but soon, of course, of course Donald started off bringing about, bringing, uh, publishing all kinds of Chinese versions of his book, so we could not stay behind and had to make a Chinese version of ours. I'm so happy it will be there in April. Um, and this book basically helps designers to much more than designing the artifacts or the, the manifestation, it helps designers to design the purpose, to design the reason underlying their design, which is, we believe, an aspect of the design process that has been underestimated for way too long because design methods were very much influenced by the engineering disciplines. That's probably one of the reasons that this happened. So many of the design methods that you see in the textbooks of design are much more about solving problems and coming up with a manifestation that does the right thing <coughs> instead of designing the problem itself or designing the purpose underlying the design. Um, this is um, to show or to illustrate that designers are always looking for a reason, right? And of course, if you think of where can designers find their reason, the first thing um, that comes to mind is, well, go to the customers, go to the users, go to the people, right? And ask them what they want. Well, we all know what happens when you ask people what they want. This is the kind of illustration that shuts down any discussion about that. Um, and so just asking people what they want, already Henry Ford knew it and many people know it, it there's, there's a lot of problems to it. I'm not saying that we should never consult people or involve people, and I know that Pity Jan Stoppers, one of my esteemed colleagues, is a good friend of Donald as well, and he is, he is, world, he is known worldwide for his research on how to involve people in the design process, how to map their needs, how to map their, the context of their lives and their experiences, yet there is a risk, an inherent risk in involving people in the design process that uh, you are probably aware of, and that is nicely illustrated here, I think. So in our view, and that's the, the view of designers that we have been advocating all the time, is a designer is someone not so much who solves the problems of today, but who has a personal vision, a personal vision of what's needed in the world of tomorrow. And then, of course, has the ability to give this vision shape. And that's, uh, it's a very simple thing to say, but it has a lot of consequences for how you support designers and how you feed the design process and how you support designers in doing the right thing. Um, this is a politician. This is a politician of which we don't have too many at the moment uh, worldwide. This is the former prime minister of Belgium. Some European people might recognize him. He's currently leader of the liberals in Europe. And he has voiced repeatedly against the current, you could say, in the, in, the, in the media, that it's the task of the politician to, um, to paint a picture of a world of tomorrow, where we want to go, and then convince the people, the voters, that this is the right way to go. Well, we don't see a lot of those politicians anymore who really have an idea of where they want to go. That's and I believe that, and I've said it a couple of times in Europe, and not everybody likes it, but let's just repeat it here. I think that designers, according to our view, according to this view, are more or less like politicians, in the sense that these kind of designers, they paint a picture of the world of tomorrow as we want to have it. They take responsibility for the world of tomorrow, because we, are, we designers are ultimately giving shape to the world we live in, right? So we have to take responsibility for that world and uh, try to uh, picture it as best as we can and then convince the people, the customers, the users that this is the right way to go. Well, that voice, we are not the only one who has this kind of voice. It's the voice of the radical researcher, the designer as a radical researcher who envisions and investigates a new product meaning. And probably some of you already recognize this quote. It's from this book by Roberto Ferganti, 
and who wrote, who, who wrote extensively about this notion of design-driven innovation, where he basically says things like, that I have a similar uh, connotation, you could say, designers create new markets, they push new meanings, it's about having a vision and taking that vision to your customers. And that's a similar voice, I think, as the politician I just showed. So it's all about design-driven innovation. And this design-driven innovation of meaning, developing new meanings that you think are valuable in, a, in the world of tomorrow and bringing that new meaning to your customers, that's the kind of designing that we want to encourage and support with our research. And you could say it's all about first designing the why, the underlying reason of your products before you start to set out to design the experience itself or the way people interact with your product and ultimately the what. <coughs> so let me give an example. Um, this is a very recent example from a design project I did with some students from the design school that I've started to build in India. That's called The Design Village. I love that name. They really want to build a real village in India where these designers are trained. These are first year design students of that school. And I was there for a week to do a design workshop with these students. And we, we selected some interesting topics or domains to work on. And one of these domains was gender inequality. So uh, we don't start really with a problem, certainly not with a product problem. We start with a domain, and the domain was inequality in society. And this is typically the kind of outcome of one of these groups where they picture, let's say, the world of tomorrow in which all the different elements that bring this world together was, br um, was mapped by the students, and they look at all the different interrelations between the elements. And based on, and one of these elements was this notion of the bystander effect, uh, the psychological principle or phenomenon that individuals do not offer any means of support to a victim when other people are present. You probably have heard of this effect before. And you probably also know that violence against women is, well, I wouldn't say it's common in India, but it happens too often in India, and it's considered a major a problem of uh, national importance. And <coughs> based on this view of the world, as they painted it, they come up with this goal. This was their, let's say, their design raison d'etre. We want bystanders of a crime committed against women to feel empowered and start acting by making them realize that everyone is related. So this is something the students came up with. And what is interesting is that, so they, they looked, they reframed, you could say, the issue, the issue of uh, women violence into a bystander problem, that people do not act. They want to empower people to act by making them realize that everyone is related. So they use this, this, um, this mechanism of relatedness when you feel that other people have a similar uh, perspective on things that, that empowers, that that will empower you. They use that mechanism in order to uh, make something happen. And this is the very simple design they came up with. Uh, and the simple design is a wristband that all young people in India will wear. It's handed out by the schools or the universities. When you have shown that you are, uh, have the right moral standards, let's say, and the, um, the willingness to act, and when old people, the young people in India, and we talk about about 300 million people, are wearing such a wristband, and these young people are typically a lot on the streets, then whenever there's a crime committed against women, these young people will look at, they will look at each other's wrists, and they will see, I'm not alone in here. I can act by, when I act, I know that these others will help me to do the right thing. I think this is a very simple and powerful um, way to counteract social issues. So Counter, when is, sorry. When is the, um, the additions? Or the yeah, that's that's a detail they came up with. They said it like in judo where you get um, the you call it the dam, I think, on your um, <coughs> on the belt, the judo belt. Uh -huh. 
so the, that you go to the next level. So this indicates that you are, uh, well, more experienced or whatever. Experience. Yeah, exactly. More experienced or that you have proven that you can act. Right. But it's yeah. the act of actually just owning the band and seeing other people having it that gives the power. Exactly. So social design or how design can uh, change the social rubric or impacts has social implications that we can actually use to create a better world, as we put it, is the topic of the next book that will be out in hopefully somewhere this year that I wrote together with Nienke Tromp, one of my former PhD students on social design. So uh, keep an eye on it. And Nienke was also responsible for a project, Nink is a very good designer, and she did a project, another typical project, uh, for um, the Mental Health Care Institute in the Netherlands, where we did a project against uh, psychosis. So the question of the Healthcare Institute was, can you help us to design new products and services that would help, the, that would promote the situation of people who are suffering from a psychosis. People who are suffering from a psychosis, as I hope you know, they hear all kinds of voices in their head telling them that they are not very good. So um, what we came up with, what Nienke came up with and the design firm, is that uh, this, this understanding that these voices are generated somewhere in your brain and it must be possible to tap into that same brain area with other means. So we looked at various means in which you can tap into that brain area and we finally found out, they found out, that there's actually a particular, that's a word generation area in the brain and that word generation area can be tapped into by allowing people to play a word game. So we designed an app for, for patients with a psychosis that they can play whenever they hear these voices, whenever they are on the street, in the tram, wherever they go, they can start and play that game and then the voices will stop. And this uh, design, this app design, won the Rotterdam Design Prize, which, was, which is one of the best or most renowned design prizes in the Netherlands. These are just two examples where we show that understanding how people work, how the psychology of people work in social domains, the bystander effects, or in neurological terms, in this case, helps you to come up with completely new designs that nobody had thought of before. Um, and I think, and that's also the kind of design research we set out to do. So this is an example of design research of one of my last PhD students who set out, and I'm, uh, it's a pity that Don had to go, but this is about the, the value of negative emotions. So whenever designers design for emotion, like all the designers do that uh, use Don's book on emotional design, they tend to think in terms of we have to promote some kind of positive emotion, right? We have to make people more um, happy or pleasantly surprised or fascinated. But negative emotions can be a powerful source for designers as well. At least that's what we uh, thought, because negative emotions are part of our repertoire as much as the positive ones. And they also have all kinds of um, <coughs> effects on people, action, tendencies, for example, that we can use positively as long as we frame the emotion in a protective way, like what happens in a roller coaster, this is not my son, uh, like what happens when you go to the movies, where you know that although you feel the fear of the protagonist, you know that you are safely sitting in a, in a cinema. So this is the, one of the uh, designs uh, my student came up with. It's a wristband that gives you through all kinds of tactile, tactile and uh, auditory uh, signals. It gives you the feeling that some kind of monster is chasing you. <laughs> and when you want to go running, it actually helps you. It gives you the emotional feedback mechanisms that make you run longer and faster because you have this fear response. But you know that there's no real monster there, but you get all the emotional responses that belong to it and that you can actually use for the better. Uh, another one of, that's the final one, um, 
to just show that I do all kinds of different stuff. This is from another student who is working on smart materials. Anyone working on smart materials here? Many smart materials these days are what we call computational composites. So where we have all kinds of layers of materials <coughs> with some computational unit in it that controls, let's say, the effects of the layers. So in this case, it's a tactile top layer that, that can uh, sense your touch. The, and there's, a, uh, a, there's an OLED with different colors that you can use to give feedback. And this is one of the designs. And because what I noticed, oh, there's also music here. But I can just talk and while you watch. Um, I noticed that uh, San Diego is uh, very much appreciating yoga. You love yoga. There are yoga classes everywhere in town. It's amazing. I've never been in a town with so many yoga schools. Mm -hmm. yeah. I thought I have to show you this little movie about what you can do with the computational composites. So in this case, the technology is driving the design, you could say. So this is a typical example of technology-driven design, where a new technology helps you to design a yoga mat that gives you light feedback on the basis of your touch. So basically, the, the yoga mat gives you the instructions what to do and gives you feedback on whether the poses or the, the positions that you take are the appropriate ones. I don't think she's a very experienced yoga a student, but nevertheless. Um, but at the same time, and that's the interesting part of this project, is that our, our um, experiments with this material and our designerly attempts to make sense of this material next inform the material scientists and the engineers in order to further develop the material. So uh, design can also inform technology instead of always the other way around. That's why I wanted to show this example. And now we say goodbye to the students. <coughs> um, so this notion of designing that I've been trying to defend here, what you can also call design for effects. The effect is what you need to design first, and then you come up with the manifestation that attains the effects, means that designing in this view is manifestation independent. The manifestation is an outcome of the process and not something you decide on beforehand. And I think that has all kinds of interesting com consequences, not only for the design process, but also very much for design education. If you come to think of it, it's, you can no longer define your design education in terms of all the silos that you see here, like fashion, products, service, game design, etc. Because whether a game or an app or a service or a system or an or a car is the most appropriate solution that depends on the process and that depends on the effect that you set out for yourself. And the other message that I wanted to give to the students last week in India, but now I give it to you, is that design can benefit tremendously from science and research, as I hope I've shown, and that's why it's so important that we do all this great design research. I should stop, right? Um, I had. No, but, well, I just wanted to, uh, this is a little an aside, but this is an aside that's very important to me at the moment. <laughs> um, since one year, I'm part of, I'm, I'm a politician myself, which is a really problematic position I'm in. Um, in. In the Netherlands, we have nine top sectors of the Dutch economy. They are officially um, um, give this... Um, status. It's like water, logistics, high-tech systems, uh, chemic, uh, chemistry, and the creative industry, which is very interesting, of course, and it's very fortunate. Because we are a so top sector of the Dutch economy, there's a lot of money and support going to the creative industry in the Netherlands at the moment, already for a couple of years. And there's one central body organizing this and doing the, uh, the governance of everything that happens in the creative industry. And I, since one year, I happen to be the um, scientific figurehead of that top sector, which means that I basically, well, I'm not deciding it all by myself, but I have a, I have a lot of influence on where the money, where the research money goes in the Netherlands, 
when it comes to design, architecture, fashion, gaming, that sort of thing. Okay? And this is the framework that we have been developing over the last half year that will pretty much um, guide the research agenda for the coming four years, 2018-2021, where we say, and there are two things that I want to um, show here. On the one hand, um, we as a creative industry, in the wider sense of the word, so I'm not only talking about the silos of design anymore, I'm not even talking about the silos of the creative industry anymore. I'm talking about creative professionals in general. They need a certain knowledge base, or you could say a certain set of methodologies and tools and principles to, do, to perform better. And that's what we want to work on. And they are, they are, there are three thematic areas, design for change, design for bigger societal impact, the human touch, which is all about how do we um, manage to make people do the right thing or feel the right thing or to feel the thing that they want to feel, and value creation, which is about uh, the organization and the business models for the sector itself. Along these three lines, we want to develop new knowledge. We want to organize our research nationwide. We do that by making um, connections to certain higher goals like the circular economy or the sharing economy, healthy behavior, uh, security, well-being, those kind of themes. So these are goals that you can set for, um, well, we, we as a government set and they again relate to all kinds of sectors that we ultimately want to make a difference in. And of course, here's where the money should come from. Here we find the private um, investments to run these programs because there's always a private investment necessary and if i give you an indication of what we are talking about these three programs you could say run from let's say fundamental to applied these three programs should each be around 20 million euros so we talk about serious programs that will run uh, that will be um, carried out in the dutch creative industry in the next five years and with that, I say hi to Scott. Hi. I want to end my presentation and take some questions and present my family. This, this part is my family that is also in San Diego at the moment. And the other part is the extended family. Okay, thank you.